stop the trendy train, amen? amen. Hope everybody stayed safe and warm over the last few days. A big uh, thank you to Joseph Rock for all the work he did yesterday to get our, our parking lot in order and Kenny for keeping the sidewalks clean and the bathroom on top. Amen. God is good and I just cannot say enough about how thankful I am for this church. As I look at today being our Vision Sunday, the Sunday that we kind of cast the vision of what to expect in the year ahead, there are two words I really want us to start branding on our heart. And these two words are big, B-I-G, believe in God, small town, small church, big God, and revival. we got to start believing in a big God again, church. We need to believe that he can bring revival into our community again. I'm not here to make you feel good. I'm not here to convince you to buy into religion. I'm not even here to tell you that how you're living is okay because for a lot of you guys, as soon as you walk out these four doors, these four walls, how you're living is not, not okay. But I want to open your eyes to the world that we're living in. In order to do that, I've got to say some honest things that a lot of pastors will not say in today's age. And, and that is this. The, the world that we're living in is going to hell. Amen. The world that we're living in is going to hell. The devil has won over a generation. The next generation of pastors is not there. The bold church leaders who stood up and spoke for truth have, have long gone and, and died and, and, and their names are going to be forgotten like the rest of them. And people don't realize we all we do is we study churches all week long. I know what every, I know what every pastor in our area is preaching on. I know how many people are walking to their churches. We know what ministries are working in their churches, what ministries are not working in their churches. And sadly, the bleeding isn't stopping. It's progressive. The bleeding isn't stopping. It's progressive. I don't care who you're trying to be when you're here on Sundays. You may have fooled me. You may have fooled the church. You may have fooled your friends and family on Facebook. But I promise you, you're not going to fool God. You're not going to fool God. You know, but I, but I believe in my heart that God can still bring revival to this church. And the only way that we can see true revival is asking God to bring revival. Is asking God to bring revival to a new generation that needs to see God move. Where our churches get filled again like it is today. Right? Not with snotty-nosed Christians who stick their nose up to everybody, but we need to pray that God fills our churches with broken people again. Amen. Broken people. And that His Spirit would move. And so today my sermon is titled, for this vision Sunday, it's titled, Tag Your It. Tag Your It. If you have your Bible with me this morning, we're going to look at Luke chapter 10. As you turn to Luke chapter 10, one of the biggest blessings in my life right now is being able to watch my kids grow up. It is one of the greatest things, being able to see them experience life and, and learn new things and take risks. And, and the other night, we, we spent like an hour playing, uh, <laughs> we were playing hide-and-go-seek, and we were playing tag around the house. Now, the kids loved it. Me, not so much. I'm a little bit older, and uh, I get tired a little bit quicker. I'm also a big target inside our house. And we'll tell you something else. These kids are so smart. They put Legos all over the floor. <laughs> Literally, they were putting landmines on the ground for me to break my feet on. Uh, but, but as we were playing tag, I, there was so much excitement from the kids. They were so excited to be able to tag the next person. They, they were so excited about, about, about going out and, and, and getting the next person. And I thought, man, when they went to bed, I started praying. I said, God, what, what do you want us to do for this vision Sunday? And I just kept remembering their faces running around screaming. They never stopped smiling. They were so excited to tag the next person. I thought, man, when I study revival throughout history, when I study church growth, when I study about communities that were changed by a single church, the answer is always the same. It's a group of people excited to surrender their lives to Christ. And I can tell you this. We, at least I have, in my generation, I have not seen a church where every single person surrendered it all to Christ. God doesn't bless you so that you can keep it all to yourself. Do you realize that? He doesn't bless you so you can keep it all to yourself and live a good life. Listen, we are supposed to take what God has given us and give it to somebody else as if you're playing tag. It's time we start running around our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ and say, tag, you're in. Tag, you're in. Look at the person next to you and say, tag, you're in. See, that's the problem. Y'all barely are saying tag, you're in, let alone share the gospel. If y'all can't say tag your rent with a little bit of bumps, how are you going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, which takes a lot of a lot of bigger bumps? You know what I'm saying? Say it like you mean it. Tag your rent. Tag your rent. Hey. Today we're going to look at the story of the Good Samaritan, Luke chapter 10, 30 through 37. Let's all stand for reading this holy word. Luke chapter 10, 30 37. A good day, golly. Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. 
He encountered robbers and they stripped him and beat him. Went away leaving him half dead. By coincidence, a priest was going down that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Verse 32. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion. Verse 34. And came to him and bandaged him up his wounds and poured oil and wine on him. He put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, The one who showed compassion to him. And Jesus said, Go and do the same. Tag, you're it. May God bless you in his holy word. You may be seated. Being a Christian is more than just showing up. Did you all realize that? Being a Christian is more than just showing up. It's being and living and walking like Christ. When was the last time that you shared Jesus Christ with somebody? I'm not talking about you inviting them to church. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying, when was the last time you actually said, let me tell you about Jesus? When was the last time? Not, well, I never said that game. Okay, good, good job. You ruined my point. But uh, <laughs> here's the thing. I asked my wife on Monday. I said, I said, hey, will you? I gotta go to this conference in March in, in Elizabethtown, Kentucky. I said, hey, will you call the hotel? There's a conference room right. Because I'm a big deal, amen. And uh, I said, will you call them and book the hotel for me? And I, I have some other stuff to do. And about 20 minutes later, I come back in the kitchen, and she's still on the phone. And I said, oh, gosh, she's pacing around the kitchen floor. And I'm like, that's never a good sign when my wife is pacing. And so I said, what's the issue? And she said, this is the second person that I've been on the phone with about your room. And right when she was saying that, they hung up. <laughs> now, listen, you can mess with Abram all you want. When you mess with my baby, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the horns come out. So I said, baby, I'll take care of it. So I grabbed my phone and I, I called. It rang once. And, and they, they answered and they go, Mr. Crozier, thank you for calling Holiday Inn. We thank you for being a platform award, a platform award member. What can we do for you? I said, well, I need to talk to a manager. He said, absolutely. Give me one second. I get a direct line to the manager. Hello. How are you? Thank you for being a platinum award member, Mr. Crozier. What can I do for you? I said, well, number one, somebody just hung up on my wife and she was trying to book a room for me. Man, she said, hey, as soon as I got the phone, I will take care of her. What else can we do for you? I said, well, I'm trying to book this room for this conference in April, and there's a conference room rate. Okay? And she said, neighbor, do not worry about it. Say no more. We'll take care of it, and we'll bump you up to a suite. We'll see you in March. I said, thank you. <laughs> so I walked down the stairs to my wife. <laughs> and I said, it's taken care of. And she said, well, what do you, what do you mean it's taken care of? How, how do you? I said, no, no, no. It's taken care of. <laughs> you see, I used to go to Holiday Inn every week for two years when I was up in Cleveland. Every, every week. Same Holiday Inn. That may be a platinum award member. So if I call a Holiday Inn anywhere in the world, VIP shows up. Uh -huh. Big deal. I keep trying to tell you. I'm a big deal. And when my wife calls, she's a nobody. But me, I'm a platinum. Step up from gold, by the way. <laughs> Two steps up from silver, by the way. You understand what I'm saying? Plow! <laughs> Taylor Swift! What is her name? Swift! Swift! Whatever her name is. She's got platinum awards. You know what I'm saying? So do I. <laughs> platinum. That's as high as you can go, I think. Platinum. And, and when I was thinking about this this week, I said, you know what? There are so many people who, who do this same thing with, with God. On the day of judgment, 
You're going to get up there and God's going to say, I do not know you. Depart from me. But the ones who've been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, come on, we're going to pull out our heavenly platinum car. Amen. 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 And God's going to say, welcome home, my good and faithful servant. Amen. It's not going to matter who you're married to. It's not going to matter what church you, were, you went to or how many times you mentioned you were a Christian on Facebook. What matters is this. Is your name written in the book of life? Amen. In, in this passage, the question was, who are we supposed to offer this hope to that we had? Who is your name? And I mentioned this before when I was a youth leader. There was this, this, this young girl that went on a trip to Honduras and she was so excited when she came back and we let her talk to the youth about it. She was saying all the cool things they did. They knocked on doors. They did outreach. They painted a local gym. They did a summer camp. They did all these things in Honduras. And after she got done, I said, well, why cannot we do that at our community? Why can't we knock on doors here in our street? And she said, oh, wait, I can never do that. They speak English. You know what I'm saying? I can never do that. I know the people that live on that street. Oh, I can never do that. And I'm thinking, why do we do this? Why is it easier to put all of our money into overseas missions, but we can't put a, a dime into our community? Amen. Why is it that we can sit there and, and we can go overseas on mission trips, but we can't go into our backyard and start ministering to people? Amen. Why is it so easy? We ignore what God is trying to do right here in Fountain, Kentucky. God has placed us here for a reason. He has surrounded us with friends and family and neighbors for a reason. It's time to treat them as our mission field. But it's true with all of us. We can be kind and of friendly to people who are complete strangers all the time. I know some of you guys, when y'all come to church, you don't know anybody, so you're just nice as can be. But I also know that your kids are telling me behind closed doors, as soon as y'all get home, you're terrible. <laughs> you're hateful. I ain't going to tell you who it is. But it's true with all of us. We all do this. And so let's look at this passage and look at the vision we have for our church. It's time we make a commitment to God. It's time we start playing tag to our community. It's time we start saying tag, you're in. The game of tag is very simple. Three rules of tag. These are the three rules of tag. First rule of tag is somebody needs to be it. Someone needs to be it. You need to be it. It is the person with the power. Did y'all realize that? It's the one who controls the game. If the person who is it decides he doesn't want to play anymore, guess what happens? Game over. Game go, right? And that seems to always be bound to happen when you're playing with you know, a bunch of kids. They get tired, and, and they're tired of chasing, and then they say, well, I don't want to play anymore. And the game doesn't work if the person that's it doesn't want to play. Does this make sense? we got to play the game. we got to play. You cannot make a difference. You cannot bring revival to a community if you don't have a group of people who want to start the game off and say, I'll be it first. And all it takes is one person. Here this man is left to the side of the road half dead. The first person who's done on was a religious person. A religious person who comes by. This is the picture of organized religion. Which let me tell you something. God cannot stand organized religion. So why do we try our best to be an organized religion kind of a church? Why do we do this? God doesn't like organized religion. And what do we do? We want to be an organized church. Get out of Dodge. We can't do that if we up the traditions that we're supposed to be doing. I don't care less about your traditions. You want to know why? Because God can't stand our traditions. Gosh, it makes no sense. The one thing Jesus complained about when he was on, on, on earth was about organized religion. The Pharisees and the Sadducees. And yet, what do we do as a church? We try to form ourselves to be exactly the same thing God can't stand. I'm telling you, the church has become full of hypocrites and snobs, and we are literally the modern-day Pharisees. We are the brood of vipers. Just like this priest, this priest walks by and sees this man beaten, and his heart doesn't even flinch. His heart doesn't even flinch. And he probably says, well, it's not somebody that goes to my church I shouldn't have to worry about. It. Right? It's not my problem. If I help him, people might think I'm associated with this guy, so it's not my problem. And so he walks on. The next one is the Levite. This is uh, Brittany's ancestors, the Levites. And the Levite sees them and walks on by as well. Walks on by as well. Then comes the good Samaritan, the ones the Jews never associated with themselves with. And here's this Samaritan. He sees this man half dead, and he has what? He has compassion. He bound up his wounds and took care of him and took him into an inn, and he gave the innkeeper enough money to take care of him. And this is exactly what God wants us to be. He doesn't want us to be religious. He doesn't want us to be an elite. He wants us to be a servant. Did y'all realize this? He wants us to be a servant. He wants us to be a follower. He wants us to be like him. When it comes to our churches, we have to start following God. God wants us to be a hospital for sinners and not a fraternity for us. You understand that? This ain't a fraternity. 
Okay? You want to miss church next week? I'll pray for you. But we still got people to minister to. Y'all understand this? Y'all miss church the next week and the next week and the next week. We're going to try to reach out to you. Our outreach team does a pretty good job of sending y'all cards. But at some point, Abram's got to move on. You want to know why? Because there's people that need to be ministered to. There's people that got to be saved. This is not a fraternity. This is a hospital for sinners. But before we go out into our communities, you need to understand that you can't tag other people and make them it if you aren't it first. You can't go around spreading the hope of Jesus Christ if you don't have the hope of Jesus Christ in your life first. You need to make sure that you're it. How many people were unprepared for the ice storm, storm this week? Anybody? Yeah. Be honest. I'm Anybody unprepared for the ice storm this week? Uh, <laughs> those meteorologists, man, I, I, I give them a lot of uh, trouble because they usually are wrong. And they usually disagree with one another. None of them can get on the same page. But this ice storm, they all got on the same page. They're like, yeah, this is going to be kind of bad. <laughs> all of them. And so... Even though we had warnings from all of the uh, people, they're like, yeah, this is going to be a bad ice storm. Some of us were still unprepared. I opened up my freezer on Thursday, right in the middle of the storm. <coughs> opened up my freezer because I thought to myself, this is one of those frozen pizza and Coke kind of days. You know what I'm saying? Just me? Okay. Open my freezer. There's no pizza. <laughs> I said to my wife, we've known about this ice storm since last Saturday. Which means, ice storm coming, and you've got to be stuck inside the house, you better have what? Pizza and bacon. <laughs> it doesn't have to be on the same thing. You can do it separately. You can cook bacon separately and put it on a pizza. I'm not that you understand what I'm saying? Pizza and bacon, it's not that hard. I was in my freezer and I'm like, I, I didn't see anything. There, there, there was no DiGiorno. There was no Tony's. No Red Baron. No Kirkland, even. California, South Florida, California pizza. No. Great value, right? We didn't even go to Waterworld to get great value pizza. There was no Jack pizza. There was no Totino's party pizza. <laughs> so I said, where do you want the pizza? My wife said, and I went to the store on Wednesday. Right before the storm hit. She did. I'll, I'll admit that. She did. And she said, I bought a frozen pizza. And Abram made it. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember, I did for lunch on Wednesday. I had a frozen pizza. And so, yeah, it was actually me. I ate it. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I felt so bad. I was yelling at my wife because she was unprepared. But I made us unprepared. And uh, it was a very sad day at the Crow's house. But on the day of judgment, God's going to say, look, I warned you over and over and over again. I warned you over and over. I, I gave you plenty of time to prepare, and yet you ignored me. You forgot about me. You didn't pay attention to me. Or you ate it all up before it came to me. You know what I'm saying? But, but church, we have to have a sense of urgency. You don't play, uh, you don't play tag walking. Did you all realize that? Tag wouldn't be very easy. You wouldn't be affected to play tag if you walked around. You have to run. So the first little tag is you need to be it. The, the reason we have so many church people who are refusing to give their hopes to others is because they don't have hope themselves. They don't have hope themselves. I have so many conversations with pastors and church leaders about how to grow a dead church, and this is, this, is, this is where I tell them they have to start. In order to bring life into a dead church, you have to make those dead people realize that they're dead. You have to make them realize they're dead. And a lot of times pastors want to come into these dead churches and not minister to the ones that are there. They just want to try to use those dead people. And they go, all right, you dead people, go out and, and try to invite people to the community. Well, guess what? When somebody, like a zombie, walks up to you and calls themselves a Christian and says you should come to our zombie church, you think people actually want to come to your zombie church? No! Why? Because you look like a zombie. You don't look like you've got any hope. You know what I'm saying? Wake up! Get excited again! Be, be excited! You know? On the other side, we're pastors... We have pastors that minister to the people in the church and, and then they never step outside those four walls. But inside, those guys are, you know, spiritually depth. You know what I'm saying? They're, they're, they're very knowledgeable about the Bible, but they never go outside the four walls. you got to be able to do both. I know there are some here today that, that, that don't have Jesus in their heart and you may have said a prayer when you were a kid, but you know there's nothing living inside of you. You may have got saved at BBS when all the other kids raised their hand because I love BBS. They, all the pastors at BBS, they go... How many, how many of y'all kids want to, want to go to, to heaven? Oh. How many of y'all 
want to go to hell. No. Well, you got to get saved. And they're like, okay. I don't know what that means, but I'll get saved. Blows my mind. Then we go, oh, we, got, we had 20 kids give our lives to Christ. Didn't you? Or were they just trying to avoid it? You know what I'm saying? Hell. Adults do the same thing, though. Y'all are just trying to avoid hell, too. I know it. I got you. Here's the thing. If you guys aren't going to heaven for Jesus Christ, you know what I'm saying? You're going to miss a step. Because we got a lot of people inside our churches that are, that are literally just getting saved just so that they can avoid hell. But they don't want Jesus. They just don't want hell. You understand? we got to get to this point. If you want to be, be people of hope, you got to know that if Jesus came back, you would sit there and go with him. You have to be able to know it. Aiden Crusher does not have to wonder what's going to happen because I am saved. I'm saved. I know I'm saved. I know when I die, I'm going to heaven. I know I am. So, so the first rule of tag is you need to be in. The second rule of tag is this. Once you are it, you need to tag somebody who's not it. You need to tag somebody who's not it. Do you know how weird the game of tag would be if the person who was it didn't chase anybody around so they could also be it? It'd be a weird game, wouldn't it? If the person that's it is like, eh, I don't want to do anything. I think it's weird when we have Christians in churches who claim they're saved, claim they're it, but they don't chase anyone around so they can experience the fullness of God in their life. I think that's weird. We need to have a heart of compassion. We have people in our own homes who are heading straight to hell, and we have no sense of care in our lives about it. Our kids are going to hell. We don't care. As long as they got their video games, as long as they're you know, not bothering us and sit, staying in their room and doing whatever else they want to do on those phones, which are literally the portal of hell, we go, as long as they're not bothering me, huh? Fine. Makes no sense. We have over 13,215 people in Pilton County who are unchurched and nobody seems to care. A population of 14,500, I think that's what we are, 14,500. Literally, more than 90% of the people in Pilton County do not go to a church of any kind any Sunday. We don't care. Let me make a challenge for you for the month of February. Pick a local funeral home. Go to People's. Go to Wood Ends, and for the month of February, anytime they have a funeral, go to them. Anytime somebody dies in Fountain, Kentucky, and they have a funeral at People's, go to the funeral. Set to the service. And then you tell me how lost our community is. Tell me how lost our community is. Tell me how far gone our community is. In verse 33 through 34, it says the Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. He felt compassion. He came to the bands of his wound, pouring up all the wine and oil on him, and he put them on his animal, brought them to the end, and took care of them. Jesus had compassion for you. Just like this good Samaritan had compassion for this guy that was beaten up, Jesus had compassion for you when he was on that cross while, while he was in heaven. He came to this earth for you. And if Jesus is willing to do that for you and me, what's our excuse for why we can't do that to somebody else? Why can't we go to somebody else who's hurting? We have parents in this community who care more about where they're going to get their next drug hit than, than they do putting food on the table of their kids. We, we have people who care more about their job title and their place of business than they do about their souls. We have people in our community that are walking around looking for something to steal, looking for something to take, looking for something to destroy, and we also have people living under the bridges in our town who are just trying to stay warm. Found a huge homeless crisis we don't even know about. And we think that the churches that are feeding the homeless, even though they feed the same 20 people every, every week, we think they're doing stuff for the homeless people. I can promise you they're not. Because the homeless people aren't leaving under the bridge. They're standing. <coughs> they're standing. Right? We adopted the nature trail that leads to the Falmouth Dam, which we're going to need some volunteers this spring and summer if anybody wants to help out with that. All you do is pick up the trash and show it nice and easy, keep it nice and presentable. Uh, if anybody wants to do that, see me after. Uh, but... Man, every time I go down there, you can look under the bridge of uh, a fountain, that bridge right there. You can look under there, and there's a makeshift tent. So I live in there. And you can do that, I guarantee, to most of the bridges in our community. And we have no idea. Or we don't care. We don't care. This community is in bad shape, and nothing will ever be done until somebody says, you know what? I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to make a difference. I'm not going to walk over the problem anymore. I'm not going to look the other way. This town doesn't need more regulations. You understand that? This town doesn't need any more zoning laws. We don't need to see Mark Branham. Somebody, uh, where, where's Kitty? Did that light go out on that side there back behind you? Did that light go out behind you on the side? Got to make sure, man, sometimes this is bad weather. You got to keep up with this stuff. We have to make sure that we do not Walk over the problem. We, we have to make sure.
sure that we don't sit there and, and ignore it. And, and this town doesn't need more laws and regulations and zoning laws and all that stuff. We don't need to see Mark Branham in the Facebook because everybody's yelling at him because he's having to give everybody these tickets because they're not giving up anything. No, no. We shouldn't have to worry about all that stuff. You want to know why? we got to care about our town as a church. Amen. Our town. You understand that? It's not, no, who cares about city officials? It's our town. It's our mission field. We got to do something about it. On March 20th, we're closing the church that day. We're going to spend the morning picking up trash like we did last year. We're not doing it for money, for fame, or anything. We're just going to pick up the trash. You know why? Because this is our town. This is our mission field. We're going to do it to make a difference. We're going we're gonna to clean up the nature trail to make a difference. We're going to support the guest wing home to make a difference. We're going to pour thousands of dollars in outreach. Why? To make a difference. We're going to help families. Why? To make a difference. Because that is what God has called us to do. So, so first we need to be it. Second we need to make sure somebody else is it. And then the last rule, you got to involve other people, man. You want to be effective at that tag? you got to involve other people to play with you. The more people you tag, the more opportunities we have to reach people. Do you realize that? The more people you can involve, the, the bigger of an impact that we can have. And when I was a kid, man, we played tag with my brothers. And I'm telling you, I, I was so smart. I would, I would go and I would run up to my mom if I was it. I would go up to my mom and I'd say, you know what, Aaron hit me. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't even do anything to deserve it. And so my mom would call Aaron over. Aaron, come here. Now, Aaron was her favorite, so she wasn't going to do too much. That's why I picked Aaron. Then that, while she was talking to Aaron, I would run. Ten. Ten. See what I'm saying? Aaron, you're such a genius, I know. <laughs> they called me a prodigy growing up. I don't know what that means, but. And I'm not saying we, I'm not saying that we have to be manipulative as Christians, all right? But but we want to we want to create a culture at this church that we do not do it alone. And we don't just do it alone. That Samaritan didn't help that man alone. He became a witness to this poor man who was beaten and robbed, but he also went to that innkeeper and became a witness for that innkeeper. Did y'all realize this? He showed him what it meant to live for Jesus, and on top of that, he included the innkeeper who was now involved in the mission to be a blessing for this man. So this innkeeper doesn't say where his heart was, but he was now being a blessing as well. One of the greatest things that I love about our outreach team is that we're able to involve other people in helping us bless those in our community. We get to involve other stores and, and restaurants to help us be a blessing to those in our community. Us being a host church for Night to Shine gives us an opportunity to partner with other local organizations to be a blessing for people, which I encourage you guys to pray about. Our Night to Shine is, is Friday. Pray we can be a blessing. But look at, look at verse 35. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of them. And whatever, you, whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Listen to me, church. Don't just do things on your own. The greatest witness that we can ever show our non-believing friends is to take them with us, with us. Not only just the church. Take your non-believing friends with you to serve. I think it'd be a wonderful thing for, for a serve day on March 20th. Yeah, that'd be a great day. March 20th. I'd love to see a bunch of sinners come into the church and picking up trash around town. Get, get your church. Hey, we're not having church today. We're just going to be picking up trash. Hey, he's not going to preach to you. Nobody's going to yell at you. Don't stand. <laughs> We want you to come pick. That's a wonderful testimony. Because your non-believing friends are going to sit there and see the compassion that you have for this town. They're going to see the, gift, the compassion that God has put on your heart. I promise you it will change you. It will make them question why you're doing it. They're going to wonder how they can get a heart like that. It's time to involve others. And listen, this good Samaritan didn't just leave this innkeeper to take care of this man by himself. You understand this? He said, I'll come back. He didn't say, innkeeper, he's your problem now. He said, no, I'm going to give you enough money to take care of him, and then I'll be back. The gospel is one of the greatest things in the world. It should bring us excitement just like it does when the boys are playing tag. When I see pastors who preach from a place of hate and it, and it leads you to feel in the church like you got beat up for nine rounds. Anybody ever been to a church like that? I've been to tons of churches where I just feel like I got beat up for nine rounds. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm the worst person that ever lived. You know? If you go to a church, I've seen people do that. That's not the God I serve. I serve the God of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. People should know us by our what, church? Our love. They should know us by our love. People should see the love that we have for one another. How do people know you? I went to McDonald's this week as soon as I pulled up to the window. As soon as I pulled up to the window, they said 1278. You can pull around. I said, well, I didn't order. I hadn't ordered yet. And they go, no, no, 1278, you can pull around. 
I said, well, I didn't order yet. I remember I was a pastor. I had to keep my composure. I'm like, sir, I didn't order yet. He goes, no, no. Number three, plant bacon and cook. I said, how did you know that? He goes, you always order that, Abram. <laughs> I felt victimized, and I'm like, I used to, you know, even though they had cameras. I said, well, how, how did you know I was going to order that? You always order it. I said, what if I wanted a McFlur? <laughs> He said, our ice cream machine is broken. Pull around. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. How well do people know you? How well do people know you? Right? How well do people know you? When you walk into a room, do people know that you're not going to cuss around because you're a Christian? Do people know that you're not going to tolerate any, any bad behavior because you're a Christian? Do they, do they know they can come to you with any issues or problems and you won't say that you'll just pray for them, but you actually will pray for them? There was a pastor in Ludlow. I'll tell you this. Um, last Sunday, he was preaching up a storm. I just watched a sermon this week. He was preaching up a storm in Ludlow, Kentucky, First Baptist Ludlow. He was preaching up a storm. and He was talking about when God comes back for him. He was a preaching and a preaching. God is coming back for me. He said, at the very end of the sermon, he said, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go when God comes back for me. On Monday, he had scheduled surgery uh, for an infection on his pacemaker. During the surgery, uh, a vein in his heart tore, and he went into cardiac arrest, and he ended up passing away on Tuesday. Pastor preacher on Sunday dies on Tuesday. I don't care who you are or what you've done in this life. Every single one of us will have to die. The question you have to ask yourself is, where are you going when you die? When I preach at your funeral, what am I going to say about you? Huh? Will I be able to say, I know where this person is? Will we be able to celebrate it and jump for joy because we know that you're in heaven? Or is everybody going to be looking at each other going, I'm not really for sure. It's time to give our lives to Christ. And you may be here saying, well, my, mar my marriage is broken. So what? Your marriage broken? So what? Give it over to Christ. But I'm addicted to drugs. So what? Give it over to Christ. But, but I can't stop living in sin, Abram. So what? Give it over to Christ. Amen. Amen. But I'm hurting. So what? Give it over to Christ. It's time we give our lives to Christ. It's time we become the hands and feet of Jesus and, and turn this town, which everybody has written off for years and years and years, and start believing that maybe, maybe, we serve a mighty and big God who cares an awful lot about the people of town. Do y'all believe that? Because I can tell you this, there are a thousand in our community that doesn't have a church to go to today. There's a thousand, thousand people in our community that don't have a pastor to call their own that doesn't know about the grace of God, and we have to decide, are we going to go to them and bring them to the end so they can be healed, transformed,